Okay. Um, so hello and welcome back to the Refugee Studies Center's public seminar series here at the University of Oxford. Uh, my name is Dilar Dirik and I'm a postdoctoral researcher and a course convener here at the Refugee Studies Center. And I'm running this term series, which is titled Resistance, Justice, Liberation, Critical Approaches to Knowledge Production on War, Colonization and Violence. Um, this is the fourth seminar in this series. Last week, we were joined by Professor Dibyesh Anand, who talked to us about the violence of Hindu nationalism in India. And you can catch up on the previous talks in this session in this series at the Refugee Studies Center's YouTube channel. And today we're lucky to be joined by Nisan Alija and Ganesh Dashse, who will talk to us about their research on peace struggles in Turkey. Um, and I will introduce them in a moment. Um, and before that, I will say a little bit about this series and then introduce the speakers. Um, so just a few comments. This event is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Refugee Studies Center's YouTube channel. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, please write your questions in the comments um, or your comments on the Q&A function here on Zoom. And we will only upload the speaker's presentation, not the Q&A part to YouTube. Um, so the title of this seminar series, as I mentioned, is Resistance, Justice, Liberation, Critical Approaches to Knowledge Production on War, Violence and Colonization. And our previous speakers have done a great job highlighting the role of global power dynamics in the reproduction of violence, forced migration and dispossession. Uh, we heard about the socioeconomic violence of neocolonialism, we talked about the ways in which patriarchal violence is also a tool for oppression and control. And we learned about the role of ideology in the normalization of measures that marginalize, uh, discriminate against and victimize entire populations. So in refugee studies or forced migration studies, people often talk about the root causes of forced displacement. And of course, it goes without saying that war is at the heart of these questions. Uh, there is much work, much meaningful work being done on responding to humanitarian crises, but hopefully many of us here would agree that a much more sustainable and just solution to conflicts and violence uh, and all the factors that drive forced displacement is peace. And meaningful peace, of course, comes uh, with justice. Uh, so today our speakers are going to talk about their research on a place that has been longing for peace for many decades. Uh, the war in Turkey and Kurdistan is at the heart of many other conflicts and issues in the Middle East region today. And between 2013 and 2015, uh, there was a very exciting um, period of hope during the peace process. But unfortunately, the developments in the last couple of years have been marked by militaristic and violent approaches to a conflict that is actually politically solvable. And only yesterday, this is important to mention, the Turkish president Recep Tayyip Erdogan has announced another military operation in the majority Kurdish regions of Syria. So in light of such developments, uh, which, as you can see, are very much ongoing, it is all the more important to amplify that there are also powerful struggles for peace um, and justice, past and present. So it's really um, a, a pleasure and an honor to be introducing today's speakers. Uh, Nisan Alaju is a PhD researcher at the Transitional Justice Institute at Ulster University. She's also a researcher at the Ankara-based Demos Research Association. Her research engages with questions around critical peace, transitional justice, gender and victimhood. And Gunesh Dashle is a lecturer at the Friedrich Schiller University Jena and doctoral researcher at Jena Center for Reconciliation Studies in Germany. And Dashle uh, pursues the research project of transitional justice from below, the case of the Kurdish conflict in Turkey and has worked as a researcher at Demos Research Association based in Ankara. Uh, her academic interest relies on the areas of critical transitional justice, the Kurdish conflict, reconciliation, bottom-up peace building, and gender. So thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we all look very much forward to hearing your, um, your research. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Ilar, for the great introduction and for inviting us. Uh, we are really excited to share our work with you today. I'll just try to share our PowerPoint presentation, um, which I always find confusing for some reason. Um, can you see it now? 
Yeah, okay, great. So I will just give a very brief overview introduction to what we are going to talk about today. Then I'll give the floor to Gunesh to talk more about some of the main section of our uh, research report. Uh, and then I'll continue speaking for a little bit about our findings as well. Um, so during this presentation today, we'll start with our research objectives and methodology. Then we will be talking about um, policies that shape the peace struggle by women's and LGBTI organizations. Then we'll move into from traditional methods to creative section, which is one of the uh, sections we have in our report. And this will be about the peace activities uh, that the organizations mainly pursue. And then I will be talking about joint struggle for peace. Um, and this will be about the alliances and divergences when different organizations work together towards the common goal of peace. And finally, we'll conclude the uh, talk with um, the impacts of war and authoritarianism on the joint struggle for peace. So we will also be talking a little bit about how the recent years of deepening authoritarianism and ongoing conflict affected all these uh, peace activism. So I'll start with the research objectives, why we did want to uh, do this research at the first place and what methodology we use. I won't go into too much uh, details and they are uh, in our report in a very much detailed version. So if anyone is interested to uh, read more, you can go read it in the report or we can talk about them more in the Q&A session. Um, so we basically looked at women's and LGBTI organizations activism around peace, but also their conceptions, their understandings of peace. And to do that, we focus mainly on the 2013 and 15 peace process, which dramatically collapsed and led to the re-escalation of violence in the, violence in the Kurdish region. Um, and our methodology basically was based on semi-structured in-depth interviews. We interviewed um, nine participants between January and March 2021, so a little bit longer than a year uh, now. And the main thing is here is I think the interviewees were not required to officially represent their respective organizations. This is important because it means that not all these ideas or uh, thoughts that are expressed in the report or in the research, they are not necessarily representing uh, the organizations of these participants, but they are represent representing the experiences of our participants when they were involved in peace activism, mainly around this period between 2013 and 15, and they were all organized in some initiatives or platforms. So they, are, they talked about their experiences there, but it also enriched our research because some of them talked about more than one organizations because they did um, different things in different organizations, but it is important to mention. And eight of these interviews were um, Zoom and Skype based interviews, but one of them was a written one because that participant uh, was and still is in prison. So that one was um, a written interview. And we use women and LGBTI uh, very often in the report, but we use it as an umbrella term. So our intention is not to um, frame women and LGBTI plus categories as if they are not intersecting, but it's more about having an umbrella term to cover those who are subject to cis heteropatriarchal oppression. And this is very much in line with our uh, gender lens that we adopt at Demos Research Association. Um, based on this understanding, a gender lens requires focusing on everyone who is marginalized for not conforming to the gender roles of their society. And this type of gender analysis also emerges as a way of thinking about building lasting peace by making visible different ideologies of the domination. So this is the uh, gendered lens that informed our research. Um, and an important thing here is women and LGBTI peace activism in Turkey it date back to the start of the armed conflict almost, but there is not enough study or research done uh, to shed light on that uh, specific area, especially when it comes to the LGBTI. Uh, peace activism, there is very little written um, on, the, on the issue. That's why we were very interested to look deeply into what these organizations or individuals did. And we also thought this could uh, give us a really good um, starting point to draw a roadmap for the future of Turkey's peace activism, because both women's and LGBTI organizations were very much active, especially during that period. 
Um, I think now I'll give it, I'll leave the floor to Gunesh and then I'll, uh, I'll be back. Thank you, Nissan. Uh, yeah, here actually, I'm not going to talk about that much, the background of conflict. I will just give you one second uh, for you. We'd stay with this uh, slide, like a um, little bit visualize. Actually, uh, Dilar also mentioned about this peace process, what we focus in our research, but I would like to also um, uh, get your attention on the left side because the uh, if I simplify the peak of the conflict during the, it was during the 90s and you see I don't want going to uh, scan all these numbers but I, I just want to highlight that all these uh, uh, dire consequences are uh, of war during the 90s and then this this process, uh, this peace process started in 2013 between the PKK, uh, the armed Kurdish uh, movement and um, Turkey with the AKP government. But unfortunately it was collapsed and it was failed. And the, the violence escalated again during the curfews as you see on the right side. Yeah, we can move uh, now. Uh, so first, what, um, what we want to um, discover is their uh, policies that shape the peace struggle of women's and LGBTs organizations in Turkey, uh, particularly during the um, um, focusing on this uh, peace process. Uh, and what we found out actually, this term of continuum of violence first uh, is the most important um, contributions. Uh, by feminist scholars and act activists actually in the understanding that the gendered experiences cannot be separated from each other, with sharp boundaries based on the different periods of conflict and peace. Um, so in our research, we found out that this, our participants reflected these feminist criticisms. In this presentation, I try to explain how is the con continuum of violence reflected in the women's and LGBTs peace struggles in Turkey. So I would say like it, um, it reflects in different ways. Uh, first, uh, first one is to demand peace with the line of uh, demanding a libertarian system. Does the struggle of violence um, the struggle for peace for the women activists also includes the struggle for equality, for example, freedom and democracy. Uh, I want to share uh, the a, a kind of um, a um, very short quota from one part participant from the Kurdish women's movement, uh, which we think it really very well explains the difference between negative peace and uh, positive peace in uh, peace studies. So. Peace is not silencing the guns. It, it's in many regions where there is no armed conflict. We know that women face a multitude of issues such as sexual and physical violence, discrimination, poverty, forced immigration, exploitation of labor. In that perspective, the demand for a peaceful life for women also means uh, creating solutions for them and many other problems areas they face. While it's an important demand that women be able to build a life in safety where guns are silent, they're also aware that a long-term struggle is needed to ensure a genuine, peaceful environment. So, um, uh, moving from, from this point uh, uh, that uh, we found very important is um, emphasize on not only the, the, the negative piece, but also positive piece. There's another reflection, uh, uh, which is to, to be aware of the different forms of violence produced by the ongoing war. So according to the activists, gender inequalities rank high among the inequalities. So it means that peace struggles should go alongside fighting against patriarchy. A feminist participant actually exemplifies it by saying the language of male uh, chauvinistic hype in social media, pictures of special operations troops, images, images of weapons, hashtags which read we are with our police force or we are with our state, let our forces march, rear up. That's an impossible macho performance, a sort of an expression of masculinity, in, even if the person is living under the threat of the very same violence or not. And that certain kind of masculinity defines a certain kind of femininity before itself. So 
she has to be over him. She has to look to him for her basic needs. She cannot say no to him. She has to do that. So uh, as, as the maybe la last point to highlight related to the concept of continuum of violence, um, it has a specific fi uh, phase in the geography preliminary inhabited by Kurds. Uh, for, for instance, during the curfews in 2015-2017, direct violations included sexual violence and torture towards women were imposed. But the Turkish state attacked the Kurdish women, women's achievements and criminalized the women's activities and their organizations as well. So it's not limited on the direct violence, but also um, it created different forms of violence targeted to women's um, gains and, and uh, achievements, um, so to say. Um, so there are these different main reflections to, uh, related to continuum of violence, as you see from the slide, for example, this is the picture, uh, picture from the uh, Peace Day, mainly organized by Kurdish and democratic people in Turkey, and the LGBT activists, activists carrying a uh, banner written and the undeclared war against LGBTI people. So putting a kind of uh, intersectional connection. This was the, my actually second um, point. Maybe Nisa, we can go back to the um, first, uh, first uh, slide that summarized two points as the continuum of violence. Yes, exactly. Uh, the, the last picture uh, from this piece uh, day, uh, was related to this intersection struggle. I think here I want to point out uh, their, their positions based on this intersectional struggle. Although the participants do not live in the conflict zone, like namely Kurdistan, do not face direct violence, they see themselves as the agents of demanding peace because they have the, this perception that Militarism, sexism, racism, and cis sexism are intertwined and reproduce each other. So this intersectional understanding is, 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 was quite visible for us uh, in their different activities and um, different forms of activism. So uh, when we go back to the, the, the last picture we saw, so here, uh, actually, uh, in the, the example how LGBT activists uh, intertwine their, their struggle for their identity with the world, pu putting this um, link uh, like at the end the undeclared war against LGBTI people. So it was an example of, of this intersexual struggle. So in, 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 in uh, in sum up, all these um, two particular aspects I described until now are the most important ones that shape their peace perceptions and peace understanding. Of course, there are others, but yeah, well, today uh, uh, we want to mainly mention about these two ones. From that, I would like to turn to uh, other main aspects. I want to talk about their uh, mainly their activi activities and achievements during the peace process. So we are more focused on their uh, practices. Um, although, the, as Dilar mentioned, the process was unsuccessful from the women's and the LGBTs side, actually, uh, there were some achievements that we had a chance to look closely in this research. And we want to highlight them also to, to, to record this uh, peace memory. So maybe before talking about the activities and achievements, we should also underline that even ceasefire during the peace talk or kind of diminish in political violence opened some opportunities for women and LGBTs to mobilize, to get together, uh, to, to create a, uh, alliances or uh, particularly to, to create some links going beyond the divisions that exist already in society. So in this, in this, in this form, uh, they did, they achieved uh, women and LGBTs benefited from these less violent conditions, so to say, and they enhanced their mobilization. This was one of our findings. And uh, as I said, this can be considered as an achievement. But this is also reminds us how political violence deters public space uh, for women and LGBTs activities more than men. Uh, 
And when I come back to the um, to the activities, the first one I would like to talk about the involvement of women at the negotiation table, uh, which really particularly Kurdish women and feminist women targeted the negotiation table. Um, so the first instrument I think uh, was the involvement of uh, women activists, Jaylan Baryan, uh, as the representative of the Kurdish women's movement in the age DP delegation, the, the Kurdish um, delegation, I would say. Uh, and the next one uh, was the was to building an informal mechanism can be considered as a gender commission. It was CUM, Women's Freedom Assembly, uh, which was founded uh, in Istanbul in 2015 to bring the women's agenda to the table and um, to, to, to make a link between the, between the negotiation table and women's organizations women, uh, and feminist organizations. So they kind of seek for uh, a meaningful participation instead of just uh, uh, gaining one seat for women on the table. And the other point uh, we, we, we found out in this research is uh, women and LGBT organizations um, uh, used the different ways of demanding uh, peace. They kind of discovered uh, different ways of demanding peace. Um, for example, uh, if we continue with this next slide, uh, you see this this picture um, the, that um, uh, that if a feminist women basically initiated this. Um, a sort of action called uh, Peace Point. Uh, basically, they go to a street out of the cent uh, center of the city in Istanbul, and uh, they see the rounded clothes uh, with written peace in different language, and they put uh, candles. They just sit around these clothes, and uh, they did this demonstrations in the street and kind of creating a easy way for the local people to join uh, to their demonstration for calling for demanding peace. And apart from this uh, street actions, the Kurdish women particularly uh, had some achievements in the politics before the peace process. And this also influenced the peace process. Uh, I think I'm not exaggerating if I say that the Kurdish women kind of purpled the Turkish statement um, for the first time, maybe since the foundation of Turkish Republic, by applying gender quota, by applying co-chair co system, and um, conducting uh, independent autonomous assemblies, creating uh, some assemblies for women within the parties, uh, and so on. So this kind of, um, if we go back to the, uh, our topic piece, uh, this made easier for them to get involved rapidly into the negotiation within the Kurdish delegates or in the commission built under the parliament. Uh, if we continue in the slide, I would like to also show a picture from the parliament at that time. The next one, please, please, and thank you. Uh, here, here, for example, you, you see this um, and a kind of a protest done by the Kurdish uh, deputies at that time in the parliament in general. Uh, assembly, uh, they were really active. The, this women from HDP protested the draft internal security law, uh, which was a spoiler of the of the peace process. Actually, in the general assembly by the parliament, with purple scarf, and they continued this protest for for days to deter the government um, to damage this all peace negotiations process. I would stop here and. Um, Give the floor again to Nissan. Thank you, Dinesh. Um, this picture made me a bit emotional. Uh, it's good that you stop here and now I, I need to talk again. Uh, so I'll continue with the joint struggle for peace and how um, alliances and divergences uh, fall out during this joint struggle for peace by different organizations coming from very different backgrounds. Um, there was a consensus on the basis of the peace demand, so there was a, a joint struggle around uh, the peace demand, but there were also differences of opinion in terms of the method to pursue that goal of peace. 
So there would be some uh, disagreements ba mainly based on um, the political ideologies of different activists involved in peace struggle or the gender understanding, the understanding and conceptions of uh, gender of these different activists or organizations when it comes to what would be the best way, the means and methods of um, basically working towards the goal of peace. I won't go into the details of that one, but I wanted to start with that anyway. And there was a common political framework of the demand for peace, uh, but within that political framework or to be able to work with that common political framework, some women's organizations or some uh, activists had to refrain from discussing their gender politics. So in order to um, find a common ground within that political framework of demanding peace, which was a very urgent uh, goal for all these uh, different activists, there was some need to maybe stay away from discussing deeply uh, about the differences in gender politics or the understandings of gender. And I'll get back to this in a minute. I'll speak a little bit more about that. Um, and this um, kind of hesitation or staying away from um, deeply discussing gender politics also means that there was the risk that the meaningful participation of LGBTI plus activists uh, would be a little bit limited. And also another important um, finding in this part of the research is Kurdish LGBTI plus activists criticize organizations and activists in the West of the country for not allocating the requisite sensitive to the specific situation of Kurdish Lubunyas, Kurdish uh, queer people or LGBTI um, people in their policies and actions. So in this part of the research, we were able to see some um, some grounds or some uh, aspects that different movements or different organizations um, would have some criticism about. And I'll talk a little bit about them. But before going into that, I, so I want to start with alliances and how uh, in different platforms these activists and organizations came together. And we were focusing mainly on two primary examples. Uh, we thought these are the major uh, examples. The first one is Women for Peace Initiative, uh, BIC as we uh, call it in Turkish. And the other one is LGBTI Peace uh, Initiative. And they were active in different times. There were some uh, periods that they would also uh, work together, um, but they are both important as in the sense that they were bringing together uh, women and LGBTI activists from very different political backgrounds, also ethnic backgrounds, and they were able to work towards the common goal of peace, um, especially during the peace process, but also a little bit after that as well. Um, so I wanted to mention a couple of key points about BIC, uh, Women for Peace Initiative. So BIC was very important in bringing women from different backgrounds together. And they were organized in different cities uh, of Turkey. So they would do activities, organize uh, conf conferences, symposium seminars in different uh, parts of the country to discuss peace together. And there would be women involved uh, in big coming from, um, again, different backgrounds, different political understandings, and they were able to work together. So big provided a common ground for women to embrace the demand for peace. Um, it also provided a flexible, dynamic and open door movement. And this, um, this initiative, Women for Peace initiative, never expressly defined itself as a feminist organization, uh, but it was very obvious that there was a feminist political line and an intersectionalist uh, approach. We interviewed with um, different participants who were also uh, involved in different levels in um, the in big activities. Some of them were very much organized. Some of them would go to some activities. And it, uh, also from those interviews, it was very clear to see that, that there was that feminist uh, political line. Um, and one of the key um, pillars of BIG and maybe one of the key motivations of BIG that brought the, uh, these people together was this um, thought that women in the West who were not living or who were not who were detached from the conflict zone uh, from the Kurdish region, they were also affected by the war. And they, this also means that they too were the actors in the demand for peace. So they were trying to make those links uh, and they were also trying to show how women in the West uh, were impacted by the war, obviously in different ways from the Kurdish women or from um, 
women living in the uh, Kurdish region, but they were, for example, they were working on um, research or studies to show that how uh, the national budget is also very much impacted by the ongoing war and how it uh, takes away from uh, women's lives. So they would be uh, really focusing on making those links, but that also meant that uh, women in the West or women who were physically uh, far from the Kurdish region or the war region, they also had this responsibility to take action towards peace. So this was shaping and informing many of their activities during the peace process, but also after the peace process. Uh, they were involved in lots of different um, peace actions and peace activities. And some of the photos that Gunesh uh, shared um, they were also related to this. Street actions, um, some campaigns, for example, one of the uh, campaigns was focusing on collecting menstrual pads for those affected by the conflict. So they would uh, pursue this common goal of peace through very different uh, methods. And because they had this political framework of um, women in the West are also affected by the conflict and they are also and they have to be uh, also actors in the peace, there was also a strong link between BIC and the Kurdish uh, women's movement. Uh, many activists from Kurdish women's movement was also part of uh, BIC. They would active, uh, attend very actively uh, and take part in the, in the actions or activities that Big were organizing at the time. And Big is also, maybe it's important to mention that it's a very uh, horizontally and loosely organized uh, movement initiative. So it was um, kind of easy to have these different um, involvement from different backgrounds. And in order to enhance this uh, link even further, feminist women or other women involved in uh, Big's uh, work, they would repeatedly visit the region, the Kurdish region, to make meaningful bonds. And this is something that came up in our interviews as well. Uh, so those visits, um, at least in attention, they attempted to, they uh, aimed to go beyond just daily visits, uh, but they really tried to make meaningful bonds by staying with these um, Kurdish feminist activists or Kurdish um, activists involved, organized in Kurdish women's movements, spend time together, uh, carry out daily activities together. So they really uh, tried and to a certain extent managed to form these deep bonds between Kurdish uh, women's movement and BIC. And if I continue with the LGBTI peace initiative, um, this was the first LGBTI plus organization solely dedicated to peace. That's why it is really, really important. And another um, highlight of this initiative um, based on what we found out in the research is that they were established in August, 2015, which was already, sorry, yes. Um, which was the summer uh, where the conflict restarted, violence escalated. So they established when uh, the peace process was very much uh, about to collapse or even collapse like right after that. And when they were um, making the statement, when they first established, I just read a quote from their statement. Um, they said, when violence entered our agenda in a more pressing way, we took action. We need to continue with the self-critic that we were not as supportive as was necessary in the struggle for peace during the peace process. So they uh, established right after the peace process almost uh, collapsed, but they also recognized that they, um, as LGBTI individuals or activists, they should have been much more involved during the peace process, but they uh, wanted to um, take initiative anyway. In an attempt to build coalitions, uh, LGBTI peace initiative urged all LGBTI people, organized or not, who are living under war conditions, be it at home, at school, at work, on the street, and in all areas of life, to speak for peace and embrace the demand for peace. I think this quote also shows what Gunesh was saying about the intersectionality in these uh, peace struggles, because uh, as we can see from here, uh, they are bringing together different aspects of life. So it's not only the ongoing uh, armed conflict, but they are referring to the living under war conditions at home, school, work, street, all areas of life. So they are making, um, they are kind of trying to amplify those links between uh, the LGBTI movement and the peace movement. 
And an important thing here is that uh, the founders of this initiative were coming from different political parties. They were organized in different movements. Uh, and it's also important uh, to show that they provided this common ground and they were very much open. They were encouraging the participation of um, people from different political uh, movements or political parties even. And they, um, although they established in a very unlucky time in terms of uh, the peace activities, because it was the uh, conflict, uh, the violence already uh, re-escalated at the time, they took part in um, Pride Week, bringing together, bringing the demand for peace to the for, uh, front of the Pride Week, for example. They became part of the peace blog, and they also joined actions with uh, Dick. So they, by doing all these different things, they really aim to mobilize the LGBTI people around peace on the one hand, but they also wanted to build bridges with the other actors of the peace struggle. That's why they were doing different actions, both mobilizing the LGBTI individuals coming from different backgrounds around the demand for peace, but also make these bridges and make connections with the uh, other actors such as BIC or the feminist movements who were very vocal about uh, the peace demand. Um, I continue with silences and debates regarding gender and sexuality. This is what I mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes ago when I said some uh, women activists or organizations uh, would feel the need to refrain from discussing their gender uh, politics. And this was for the benefit of a shared demand for peace. And this is this quote that you are seeing on the slide now is from a feminist participant um, who was involved in peace building politics. And I'll just read the quote now. Where we meet as women in peace politics is also a conservative place. I mean, the women of the AKP, AKP is the ruling party, the Kurdish women's movement, the women of the CHP, what all these women have in common is their conservatism. They are all conservative to certain extents. Therefore, the peace platform that I'm organized in is not a place where people bring up feminist family politics and the official family policies or the imposition of the acceptable family and the acceptable women for discussion. Um, she really talked at length about this uh, in the interview and we thought it was, a, it was an important contribution to show that in order to come together around the common goal of peace, they felt the need to leave behind maybe some of the uh, really primary, really key differences that they would have when it comes to uh, pursuing a feminist politics or gender politics, for example. Um, so I thought this code is quite representative of that, uh, that reality. And one of the most difficult issues to discuss was sexuality, according to what we have listened from different participants. Peace activists often deal with sexuality only in the context of violence. And this uh, could lead to the exclusion of various LGBTI plus identities. Another quote here is from an LGBTI activist participant this time. So first of all, of course, being LGBT cannot be reduced to sexuality and so on. We often hear what they do in the bedroom is nobody's business. Of course, that's not the issue. But on the other hand, sexuality, a person active within a struggle is often seen as detached from their gender and sexuality. Peace or anti-militarism activists tend to harbor their discourse in a non-sexual and genderless perspective. I think this is really important and it uh, also matches well with the previous uh, quote, how um, activists involved in peace activism or anti-militarism or anti-war um, movements, they, are, they tend to stay away from uh, any type of um, discourse that would be associated with being sexual um, and sexuality, but also they are perceived as, the, as if they are detached from uh, gender and sexuality. So these wouldn't come up as um, points of discussion when they were working together towards uh, their goal of peace, for example. We don't know how it would uh, play out if um, similar activities happen now, because they are talking about a couple of uh, a couple of years ago, uh, but this is what they shared with us. I had also mentioned that there was the criticism um, 
by the Kurdish LGBTI um, organizations or individuals towards the LGBTI movement's approach to the Kurdish issue. And this is also one of the uh, key aspects that we thought we need to highlight in the research. Um, and this is the criticism of tokenism in the LGBTI movement by the participants who are Kurdish or who are closer to the Kurdish political movement uh, and also organizing the LGBTI movement. So they are part of both movements. They see themselves as part of uh, both movements, but they have this criticism um, that the representation of Kurdish LGBTI in the movement is not uh, sufficient, for example, or the movements, LGBTI movements, inclusiveness of Kurdish LGBTI and its embrace of the Kurds' demands for equality uh, is not enough and there, need, uh, there is work to be done on this area. Um, and we thought this is really important uh, because this movement, um, the peace movement, um, that ha it has long embraced the discourse of society and peace as, uh, as the vital uh, goal. So this criticism needs to be taken into account. So this was uh, our uh, last finding section in the, in the report, um, something like war, the impacts of war and authoritarianism on the joint struggle for peace. So this is the section where we explore how all these joint struggles, uh, alliances um, took place or changed in the recent years, especially since uh, the peace process collapsed in 2015. And we see that the resumption of conflict, the escalation of violence, and the increasing authoritarianism severely undermined the gains made during the ceasefire period. But to, this was um, almost surprising for us to find out that following the resumption of the conflict, the immediate aftermath of the uh, collapse of the peace process, the belief that the peace process could resume continued. So actually what uh, stopped the peace activism or what uh, was the final push was not the collapse of the peace process, but it was more the deepening of the authoritarian regime. Um, so the, this belief continued after uh, 2015 summer, so when the conflict started, and these peace activists shifted their focus to putting pr pressure on the state for uh, resuming the negotiations and starting the uh, talks again. So there was still that belief that the political settlement of the Kurdish uh, conflict, a peaceful solution uh, would be possible. But more than that, uh, the, the process or the context uh, to enable that type of discussion um, was still possible. That was the talks. That's why, um, for example, both LGBTI peace initiative and big continue to work towards this uh, goal, calling to calling the state to resume the negotiations. And as I said before, LGBTI peace initiative um, was founded in that in that summer. So it is itself a very good sign that there were still hopes that um, a return to peace process was possible, was likely. And in their again founding statement, they. Um, demanded an immediate return to the resolution grants. Big at the same time uh, did lots of street campaigns and other, uh, other street actions and campaigns as well. For example, they launched a petition, 1000 Women for Peace, um, and they said they defend their right to peace and truth. They organized a peace vigil in the Arbakir in the Kurdish region in February 2016. And this was in the middle of the curfews that Gunesh uh, mentioned in the beginning. So it was a very, it was a difficult time to organize anything related to peace, but they did it anyway. And they wanted to draw attention to the blockades, uh, the curfews and the destruction in the region because they went there and um, to this peace vigil in the Arbakir, there were more than 500 uh, women uh, and LGBTI activists involved coming from different cities of Turkey. But of course, peace mothers and the Kurdish women uh, movement activists were also there. So they all got together and they organized this peace vigil. It was very important also in the sense uh, that it was showing solidarity with the women in the conflict zones. And to continue with the um, same topic, one year after the collapse of the peace process in July 2016, um, we had a state of emergency um, following the failed coup attempt. And this was a real breaking point that ended the peace, uh, peace activism in a very dramatic way. Um, and this also marks the complete loss of hope for peace. 
and this is uh, again to say that uh, the end of the ceasefire, ceasefire was not when the complete loss of hope for peace uh, happened, but it was after the state of emergency. And state of emergency um, lasted for two years. The demand for peace was one of the most uh, violently attacked and criminalized demands of the period. And as one of our participants put it, even the use of the word peace is equated to committing a terrorist attack, which uh, shows that it was really, really difficult to organize anything around uh, peace. The systematic violation and prevention of freedom of expression and the right to assembly and demonstration, um, this was very uh, prevalent in the, in the period. And it made it almost impossible to organize and call for events in the field of peace or raise one's uh, voice for peace. Uh, some other things that happened during uh, that period, I try to just mention them briefly. Shutting down human rights NGOs by presidential decrees. Um, there were lots of academics who lost their jobs or were prosecuted because they had signed a peace petition uh, for the end of the war. Um, it became almost impossible to continue the struggle for peace in an organized manner. Also, Kurdish politicians and activists, including many women, were detained uh, during uh, that period. And people who took part in the peace struggle or supported the peace um, demands faced the reality or risk of losing their jobs. There was also fear of detention and arrest. This was uh, mentioned a lot in the interviews as well. And some of our participants expressed that this fear still continues, fear of detention and arrest if they engage in uh, peace-related activities. And as a result of all these developments, survival and security became vital and urgent, both for individuals, but also for movements and organizations. And unfortunately, at the end, peace slowly and gradually fell off from the agenda of all these different peace activists. Um, I think I'm running out of time, or maybe I've already... Uh, I'll take your time, just, uh, just say okay. whatever you want to say. Yeah. Okay, oh, I think I'm almost done anyway. Um, to, so, again, uh, with the same topic, um, what happened in the Kurdish region at the time was the closure of uh, many women's organizations or the branches that were dealing with, um, uh, for example, domestic violence in uh, the municipalities. They were shut down, they were closed down by decrees again. And this meant that the safe spaces for women in the region uh, narrowed down really, really dramatically. And also because the war was still ongoing, the rising militarism and the Kurdish region was very much securitized and militarized as well. The rising militarism, nationalism, sexist politics uh, during the armed conflict um, resulted in the fact that many women had to stay away from the public sphere. Uh, or the public sphere, let's say, um, became a lot less available to women. And also the repeated arrests and detentions of Kurdish women politicians and activists uh, made the existence and survival of women and LGBTI organizations um, a major issue. And this is still uh, going on. Uh, many Kurdish women activists are still constantly being arrested or uh, taken into custody for uh, being involved in um, in human rights work or uh, feminist politics. So this is still a very serious issue that is going on. And at the same time, all over the country, there are constant attacks on the most basic achievements of women and LGBTI activists. Um, for example, lots of uh, people who would be involved in activities uh, like conferences or public discussions around how to achieve honorable peace for the Kurdish issue, or they would get together to discuss democratic autonomy, for example. Now they have to um, work around sexual abuse, child support payment, Istanbul Convention, as you may know, Turkey withdrew from Istanbul Convention a couple of months ago. So there were all these um, unfortunately more urgent issues that all these uh, organizations had to deal with now. So although they were very much involved in peace activism just a couple of years ago, there are lots of other security related, survival related issues that they have to, um, they have to take action on. So this also meant that they had um, peace also had to fall off um, the agenda. 
And another important thing here is the common areas where different movements, different organizations could come together in the past, uh, they very much became restricted and the movements had to turn um, inwards. Um, I think there were a couple of other things I had in mind, but now I'll just um, leave it to Gunesh to say a couple of concluding uh, lines and apologies if I took a little bit too much time. Um, I, I think we kind of come to the end of the presentation, so maybe we can move to the QA section maybe now, since a little bit over the time so and then um you if you want to just add a few concluding remarks you can and then we can move to the question and answer session and uh just for everybody listening right now you can start submitting your questions as well uh, Ganesh, mm -hmm. yeah actually i i would just briefly add um uh the the, the conclusion like i also mentioned about how uh, how non-violent um uh, public sphere is really crucial for uh, all women feminists and LGBT organizations. Uh, since this political sphere uh, deterred by the political violence, um, they really uh, struggle uh, by mobilization or reaching other women to, to uh, enhance their uh, activism. And also maybe uh, lastly, I can mention about that the, almost all participants uh, mentioned about, plus I think the effect of pandemic uh, uh, really uh, deters the uh, conditions um, uh, much, uh, much more expected. Uh, the, all these organizations became more isolated because of this huge pressure coming from the government in terms of mobilizing together, not only around peace, but also around uh, other like human rights um, issues or gender issues. So I think this has become a serious uh, problem. And also there is a big, big difference in Western and Eastern side, I would say, like in Kurdistan, for example, uh, the participants sometimes mention about that, like uh, we, we stay alone, we don't have that much solidarity, solidarity anymore from the Western organization. So um, the, the impacts of this, um, this direct violence uh, affected Kurdish uh, Kurdish women in in the in Kurdistan a lot as may, as Nisa mentioned that many Kurdish activists peace builders actually now still in in the jails unfortunately uh, like just uh, because of some arbitrary uh, uh, detainees because of their work for Kurdish um, uh, Kurdish conflicts resolution and uh, and their um, their uh, struggle for peace and gender rights. Yeah, I would like to stop here and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you both so much. Uh, thank you, Nisan. Thank you, Ganesh, for your uh, very important and meaningful and timely intervention. Uh, um, you know, go and check out the report that you have written and also focus on these uh, questions also in, um, in more depth. So really um, many greetings to you and uh, good luck and lots of uh, wish you great success with your work. Um, before we end, I just wanted to say that uh, the next talk will be on, uh, will be with Dr. Yara Hawari, who is going to speak about this topic, writing and researching Palestine, reflections on positionality and decoloniality. That's on June 8th. Uh, and this talk will uh, be recorded and up on YouTube very soon. So I will be in touch with you guys uh, very soon. Thank you so much again, everybody, for coming and to Ganesh and Nisan for your uh, presentations, for your time and for your energy. I really appreciate it and hope you have a, a good rest of the uh, day and uh, somebody, uh, people are already expressing their gratitude uh, to you. Have a good uh, day, everybody. See you hopefully next time.